America Responds When the war began in Europe, it greatly shocked the American public, but Wilson declared the U.S. would be neutral in thought and in deed for several good reasons. First, there's many U.S. ethnic ties. At the time the Great War erupted, 30% of all Americans were no more than two generations away from their mother countries, Germany, England, France, or Ireland, who favored Germany. The prevailing opinion was the United States should remain neutral, but most American leaders were pro-British from the onset. American tradition also believed in avoiding foreign entanglements and wars. There was also the U.S. progressive spirit, was shocked at the thought of war, having come to believe that disputes could and should be settled peacefully. Under international law, as a neutral nation, the United States could trade with either side. Both the Central Powers and the Allies looked to the United States for food and war material. To finance their needs, France and Great Britain requested loans from the United States. Although knowing this violated the neutrality of the United States, Wilson approved loans to the Allies. By the time the war ended, over $2 billion had been given to the Allies, where only $27 million had been given to Germany. Numerous Americans volunteered for the Allied military forces or joined volunteer medical groups. Although these men and women did not officially serve with the still neutral United States, they served an important role in the war effort. A pro-Allied group formed the Lafayette Esquadrille. The first major action was the squadron at the Battle of Verdun being posted on the front of May 1916 until September 1916. The planes you see in the background, the biplanes, are from the Lafayette Esquadrille. Yanks also joined the British Army or French Foreign Legion as ambulance drivers. German Americans also left to serve for the fatherland. To illustrate America's biased brand of neutrality, this political cartoon shows Uncle Sam wearing a sandwich board that advertises the nation's conflicting desires. The Sentinel the War. So how did the United States finally get dragged into this war? Well, the first thing we're gonna to have to look at is British propaganda. British propaganda writers bolstered American support with their stories of German atrocities. British and French control of the, mo of the most of the transatlantic cable made war news favor the Allies. Americans were read the atrocities of the savage Huns, but none of the Allies. Americans were told that when the Belgians challenged the German invasion of France through Belgium, Germany executed 5,000 civilians in retaliation. Americans read stories of torture, mutilations, and civil murders committed by the Germans, some which were made up, but some which were actually true by the British. Sabotage. Some attempts at sabotage in the United States by German agents were known. Dr. Heinrich F. Albert accidentally left a briefcase in a New York subway with documents showing the existence of an extensive espionage and subversive activities network operating in the United States, ready to be used. On July 16, 1916, German agents planted bombs blowing up Black Thumb Munitions Depot. These were ammunitions that were headed to the Allies in New York. The blast could be felt in Philadelphia 90 miles away. Eric Munter, a German instructor at Cornell, exploded a bomb in the United States Senate reception room and later shot American financier J.P. Morgan. Gradually, Germany was associated with navalism, militarism, aggression, especially after violating Belgian neutrality, which had been guaranteed by several European nations since 1839, and authoritarianism. After all, wasn't Germany ruled by Kaiser Wilhelm II? The Diplomacy and Neutrality The United States asked all parties respect neutral rights, outlined in the 1909 Declaration of London statement, drafted by an international conference in 1909, was designed to protect the rights of nations who were neutral in military conflicts. Germany agreed, but Britain refused. British violations. The British blockade infringed on American neutrality. As we see here where the blockade would take place. 
But Wilson conceded many rights to avoid conflict with the British. And redefined con the British then redefined contraband to include foodstuffs, textiles, and related items, forcing U.S. ships into British ports for a thorough search, a time-consuming process. Britain also mined the North Sea and blacklisted U.S. firms suspected of trading with Germans through other neutral nations. At the Battle of Jutland was a naval battle fought between Britain's Royal Navy Grand Fleet under Admiral Sir John Jellicoe and the Imperial Germany's Navy under Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer. The battle unfolded in an extensive maneuvering and three main engagements, the battle cruiser action, the fleet action, and the night action from May 31st to June 1st, 1916, off the North Sea coast of Denmark's Jutland Peninsula. It was the largest naval battle and the only full-scale clash of battleships in that war. Both sides reclaimed victory. The British lost more ships and twice as many sailors, but succeeded in containing the British fleet. The British press criticized the Grand Fleet's failure to secure a decisive outcome, while Shear's plan of destroying the substantial portion of the British fleet also failed. The British strategy of denying Germany access to both the United Kingdom and the Atlantic did succeed, which was the British long-term goals. Jutland was the last major battle in world history fought primarily by battleships. Germany resorted to submarine warfare. In its effort to break England's naval blockade on trade with the Central Powers, Germany declared the area around the British Isles a war zone and warned that any ship entering the area in February 1915 would be attacked by their submarines without prior warning. Germany relied increasingly on surprise attack, and by May, nearly 90 ships were sunk without warning. Britain countered the submarine by arming its merchant ships disguised by shipping supplies on passenger lines and by operating under a flag of a neutral nation. This was almost similar to what pirates would use, as the German submarine saw in an American flag or some other neutral nation flag they were coming to investigate. When they got close enough, the British would strike the colors, run up the Union Jack, and fire on the submarine. Wilson declared that Germany would be held to strict accountability for the loss of U.S. lives and ships. Americans agreed it was barbaric to kill civilians and believed that neutral citizens had the right to cross the Atlantic on any ship desired. Germany had warned in newspapers not to travel on ships, specifically the Lusitania, entering the war zone, that passengers did so at their own risk. Lusitania departed New York on May 1, 1915, on a return trip to Liverpool with 1,959 people aboard. On May 7, 1915, Americans were shocked when the British passenger line Lusitania was sunk off the Ireland coast, losing 1,198 of 1,924 lives, including 128 Americans <coughs> and 63 infants. In violation of international law, the ship was carrying 4,200 cases of small arms ammunition, as well as other kinds of ammunition. Wilson's response, Americans demanded war, but Wilson refused to yield. Wilson was misled into believing that no arms were on the ship at all, and the German sinking was referred to as piracy and mass murder. It included the president's assertive demands that Germany end its subversive submarine warfare. The Sussex Pledge. To cool American passions, Germany ordered its submarines to avoid sinking passenger ships. Germany's pledge during the war was called the Sussex Pledge, as the Sussex was sunk, to not to sink merchant ships without warning, on the condition that Britain also observe recognized rules of international law. Germany's Sussex Pledge specifically required Germany to obey international laws regarding the war. What it basically said is that it would, the submarine would surface, order the people off the ship into lifeboats, and then they would sink her. 
The Battle Over Preparedness The threat of war sparked a debate over military preparedness. The Revenue Act of 1916 was passed. In December of 1914, Wilson requested the Army and Navy prepare themselves for war. Although he had no intention yet of asking for a declaration, he chose to be ready if the need arose. To finance this, Congress raised the income tax to 2% in the Revenue Act of 1916. In the National Defense Act of 1916, Wilson initially opposed preparedness, but reversed his position when the submarine crisis worsened. President Wilson called for the expansion of the armed forces, and in 1916, Congress also passed the National Defense Act, which allowed the U.S. Army to expand from 90,000 to 223,000 men over five years in response to continued German aggression. Republicans and Theodore Roosevelt called for a policy of war preparedness was advocated by all the Republicans, especially Roosevelt. Those against these new policies were socialists, who opposed the war, believing that the struggle was among the rival capitalist imperialistic societies in Europe. Both William Jennings Bryan and Robert La Follette campaigned actively against preparedness, sensing that it would result in the U.S. entering the war instead of preparing for a war. The Election of 1916 For the Republicans, Theodore Roosevelt desired to be the Republican candidate in 1916, but because of his actions in the 1912 election, the party chose Charles Hugh, Evan Hughes. The Democrats nominated Wilson again, running on the slogan, He kept us out of the war, and promising peace, prosperity, and progressivism. Wilson disliked the slogan sentiment, but exploited it for political popularity. Woodrow Wilson won a second term in 1916 despite a unified Republican Party by sweeping the South and the West on campaign appeals for peace and progressive reforms. Wilson benefited from the belief of many voters that the Republicans were the party of war. America goes to war. In January 1917, President Wilson outlined a new world order in which self-determination would be the foundation of world relations. Self-determination was the right of the people of a nation to decide on its own political allegiance or form a government without external influence. In January 31, 1917, Germany announced that they would resume unrestricted submarine warfare. This would risk U.S. participation in the war. Germany's announcement of a resumption of surprise submarine attacks on merchant ships, believing that the Allies could be finished off before the United States could enter the war. Wilson threatened to break off diplomatic relations with Germany if submarine warfare resumed. But on February 3rd, Germany sank the steamship Houston Tonic, calling Wilson's bluff. Germany's decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare led to President Wilson ordering for American ships to shoot submarines on sight. The Zimmerman Telegram The British early on in the war had broken the German code. From Room 40 in the Admiralty's old building, Room 40 operations evolved from the capture of German naval code book. The single Buch der Kaiserlich Marine, which means the single book for the German Marine. The maps contain coded squares that Britain's Russian allies had passed on to them, to the Admiralty. In February of 1917, the Zimmerman telegram was intercepted and revealed. Alfred Zimmerman, the German foreign minister had instructed his ambassador in Mexico to have him request that the Mexican government join with the Central Powers and attack the United States. In return, Mexico would see back all the land that had been taken away from them by the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, and possibly Texas. Wilson received a telegram on February 24th. The Mexican government asserted that the country would remain neutral in the war, but many angry Americans called for the entry of the war against Germany. In March of 1917, German U-boats sunk five more U.S. merchant ships. Democratic newspapers were calling out 
The only difference between war and this is we are not fighting back. Wilson asked Congress on April 2, 1917, to recognize the state of war existed between the two nations. Congress, with some opposition in the House, voted 373 to 50, with the opposition coming from the German populated regions of Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Minnesota, as well as by pacifist Jean Rankin, the first woman elected to Congress. The Senate voted 82 to 6 for war against Germany. This was followed by declarations against other central powers. Wilson had idealized that the war was a crusade to make the world safe for democracy, calling this the war to end all wars. But what needs to be understood, that what got us in the war was unrestricted submarine warfare. Mobilizing a nation, recruiting an army. Although the armed forces had begun preparing for war, the U.S. Army at this time was the 17th largest in the world. Forces needed to be recruited, equipped, and trained before they were transported across the Atlantic to fight in Europe. The Navy's first role was to protect shipping convoys from the United States to Great Britain. By providing loans for the Allies, American reinvigorated the Allies in Europe. The Selective Service Act, passed on May 18, 1917, sought to increase the size of the U.S. forces. Many servicemen, however, enlisted without being drafted. Overall, about 20% of the recruits were immigrants, eventually registering over 24 million men despite their ethnicity. Three million men and two million volunteers joined the military. More than 40,000 women also served in the military. Large numbers of African-American men joined the military where they often faced discrimination and service opportunities. Following the precedent set in the Civil War, these men were required to serve in racially segregated units with white officers. General John J. Blackjack Pershing in the AEF. General John J. Blackjack Pershing got his nickname Blackjack from West Point cadets for commanding the 10th Cavalry Regiment, the Buffalo Soldiers out west, and also in the Spanish-American War. Pershing would claim that they were the best soldiers he had ever commanded. Pershing was also named commander of the American Expeditionary Force. American troops arrive in Europe. The first draftees competed training on 24th June and were sent to Europe with Pershing. On July 4th, Colonel Charles Stanton, when landing in France, said, Lafayette, we are here. This was to give tribute to the Marquis de Lafayette, who came over to help America to win her independence. The AEF arrived in Paris on July 17, 1917. The British and French wanted the Americans to be integrated into their forces under their command. Pershing would refuse and wanted their own place in the front lines under American command, remaining separate. The AEF was able to set up positions on the front line near Verdun by October. Managing the war economy. To mobilize the American economy for the war effort, the federal and state governments developed a complex structure of agencies and regulations that controlled every sector of the economy. The War Industries Board, headed by Bernard Baruch, this was the federal agency that reorganized industry for maximum efficiency and productivity during World War I. They set industrial priorities, coordinated military purchasing, and supervised businesses by allocating scarce materials and standardizing production. One effect of the War Industry Board's success was big business recognized the advantages of government economic planning. The Railroad Board operated the nation's railroads as a national system. Many progressives believe that the RA showed too much favor for the interest of big business. The Food Administration was headed up by a Herbert Hoover. Americans raise the needed funds and conserve necessary items and promote the growing of their own crops to prevent shortages. With the slogan, food will win the war. The goal was to increase agricultural production while reducing food consumption. Food exports rose from 12.3 million to 18.6 million tons, increasing farm incomes by 30% between 1915 and 1918. Families and restaurants were urged to participate in Meatless Mondays, 
and wheatless Wednesdays. The American farmer saw a boom in production and profits, finally financing the war. Taking out loans with banks and wealthy investors and raising taxes, and most important, selling liberty bonds, which was two-thirds of the war cost, and other bonds helped the U.S. government raise the $30 billion that was necessary for the war costs. For perspective, this was 30 times the U.S. federal budget in 1917. Children, including Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, got involved by selling these bonds. New labor force. More women worked during the war than before the war. Women sometimes became bricklayers, teamsters, streetcar conductors. And despite gains, gender segregation still was a social issue in the workplace. The women's suffrage movement in America made major gains during World War I. For African Americans, the suspension of immigration and the relocation of four million men to the war effort caused a shortage of workers. To find replacement, recruiters went to the South and brought back 400,000 African Americans. New job vacancies opened up for black women in domestic and clerical employment. Blacks still faced a great deal of discrimination in the North. A riot that killed 39 Americans in East St. Louis, Illinois, began when angry whites attacked blacks who sought jobs. Mexican immigrants and temporary workers from Mexico, in addition to Mexican Americans, also helped fill the American jobs during the war. Once the war ended, these various groups often faced discrimination or job loss as white men who had served in the military returned to the domestic labor force. The National Labor Board accomplished all the following goals by improving working conditions, guaranteeing labor the right to collective bargaining, and establishing eight-hour workdays for war contract laborers only. One important effect of the collective importance of wartime agencies was it set a valuable precedence of government and activism in the economy. Suppressing dissent. The Committee on Public Information, CPI, served as the foundation of the government's pro-war propaganda through newspapers, pamphlets, speeches, films, and other media which was charged with conveying the Allies' war aims to the American people and to the enemy as well, in an attempt to sap their morale. Government propaganda promoted all the following things, portraying the Germans as brutal murderers, promoting the war as a crusade to save democracy, and emphasizing national unity and conformity of opinion. The American Protective League discouraged the use of German words as part of the American English. Anything German was considered bad. Sauerkraut was now called Liberty Cabbage. German measles were called Liberty Measles. Hamburgers, Liberty Sandwiches. And Dachshunds were renamed Liberty Pups. They also encouraged Americans to spy on people who they believed were disloyal and required citizens to purchase Liberty Bonds. Colleges and universities got in the mix and stopped their German language curriculum. Radio stations also stopped broadcasting German composers like Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and Mozart. The Espionage Acts. It forbade actions that obstructed recruitment or efforts to promote insubordination in the military and authorized a postmaster to remove leftist materials from mails and levied fines up to $10,000 or prison terms up to 20 years. The main use of the Espionage Act was to harass and arrest leaders of the anti-war movement. The Sedition Act of 1918 provided severe penalties for speaking or writing against the war or criticizing government personnel. Broad law restricting criticism of American involvement in the war or its government, flag, military, taxes, or officials. The effects. The Espionage and Sedition Acts were used against leaders of the Socialist Party, the International Workers of the World, and the Nonpartisan League. It attacked radical newspapers and magazines, which were banned from the mail. State and local authorities suppressed anti-war and radical activity by establishing councils of defense 
or public safety agencies. The Espionage and Sedition Act resulted in over 1,000 convictions of disloyalty to the United States. Some Americans from a variety of political persuasions argued against the efforts to limit free speech that was guaranteed in the Constitution under the First Amendment for the sake of the war. Overall, around 1,055 people were convicted under the Espionage Act. In Schenck versus the United States, on March 3, 1919, the Supreme Court unanimously upheld the Espionage Act, limiting the First Amendment protection when words were used of such nature to present, to quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, a clear and present danger to bring about the evils which Congress should prevent. Another Supreme Court case, Abrams versus the United States, dealt with leaflets expressing dissatisfaction with the U.S. troops in Siberia, one calling for a general strike against the U.S. policy of intervention. The Supreme Court ruled by a vote of 7 to 2 upheld the Sedition Act on November 10, 1919. Clark, for the majority, cited Holmes's clear and present danger doctrine. Holmes and Louis Brandis dissented, stating, quote, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, denying that a silly leaflet published by an unknown man constituted such a danger. Eugene Victor Debs was the socialist leader, a pacifist, and criticized the war and asserted that it was another example of the exploitation of the working classes by the ruling elite. Even while Debs was a prisoner, the Socialist Party nominated him for the fifth time as a presidential candidate in 1920. He received over 900,000 votes from prison. It would have been interesting. If he got elected president, would he have been able to pardon himself? Immigration, Labor, and the War In this cartoon, responding to the Immigration Act of 1917, sponsored by Congressman John Burnett of Alabama, Uncle Sam looms behind a literacy test wall fortified with the point of the pens, books for battlements. He tells the immigrant family looking up at him, you're welcome in if you can climb it. Forces such as pseudoscience, fear, and racism convince many Americans that immigration, especially that of Southern and Eastern Europeans, threaten the nation. They feared that the impact of increased immigrants from the enemy nations while some worried about the rise of radical political views among immigrants, others feared the immigrants simply because they saw them as different. The Immigration Act of 1917 restricted immigration in many cases. It required that immigrants over 16 years of age demonstrate basic literacy in any language and increase the cost of immigration. In addition, it denied entry to, quote, idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded persons, epileptics, insane persons, paupers, beggars, vagrants, alcoholics, prostitutes, persons affected with diseases, criminals, uh, polygamists, and anarchists." End quote. The act excluded immigration by any Asian immigrants, except for Japanese and Filipino immigrants, and the gentleman's agreement made by then President Roosevelt in 1907. The Japan's government had voluntarily limited Japanese immigration to the United States. Filipinos, as members of the U.S. colony, were U.S. nationals, so they could move within the United States and its territories. Waging war and labor, immigrants and their recent descendants were not the only Americans whose loyalties were under suspicion. The U.S. government viewed both the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, and the Socialist Party as potentially dangerous entities during the war. Members of the IWW argued that they needed to focus their efforts on the battle between labor and management in the United States. Members of the Socialist Party, meanwhile, promoted pacifism. 